Thanks, team. We just don't want you to get to heaven and, like, there's one thing on the menu in heaven, and that's praise. And we just don't want you to get there and be, like, just trying it out. Um, I don't want, like, Gabriel to come up to you and just be like, is this your, like, first time? First time hand raiser? You've never sung in public? That's why we turn the music up so loud, is so that you can't hear yourself sing, but more importantly, that your neighbor can't hear you. And, uh... Have you been enjoying our series, Do Hard Things? Uh, I'm Pastor Corey, by the way. If we haven't met, come and meet uh, me and my lovely wife, my lovely wife and I. I have an education. Um, this is Pastor Aaron. Uh, we started the church about five years ago, our sixth birthday party, like a big boy church. It's coming up in two weeks, I think, right? I'm going to say two weeks. Okay, awesome. I'm confident. Um, and I, I would say, I mean, it, it feels uh, full in here uh, in the first service even, um, but if you have friends in the second service, can, can I just make a suggestion here, just logistically? The second service is like packed right to the wall. So um, if you have friends in the second service, um, you guys are the spiritual ones and be like, you got up at, you know, to make it to church at 9.30. People are like, oh, that early service. I'm like, I feel like you have to be at work at like 7.30. So... Um, but if you have friends in the second service, just maybe do a little, just see if they would be interested in joining us in the first service. We just need to make room for our guests, and, um, and God keeps blessing us with more uh, guests. So, Our series quote is this, hard times create strong men. You can throw women in there. I didn't make the quote. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. By G. Michael Hopp from the U.S. Marine Corps. Something God, that God uses to harden us as a people for the battle for the souls of the city and for your own fight to come. Something the Lord uses to uh, harden us, uh, and it's hard, it's, it's a hard test, is called the test of injustice, which I'm going to uh, preach about today. The test of injustice is when you get tackled so that somebody else can get a touchdown for the team. And so um, it's going to be a, kind of an interesting sermon. I think that I would say the large percentage of people here have never heard a sermon about this particular um, thing in this particular way. So um, how has fasting been going for everybody? You're fasting and getting more disciplined. I talked to somebody uh, in the service who's giving up all nicotine after decades. Nicotine and so like, hey man, what I'm giving up is nothing. So it's a great job. We just want to just uh, encourage that. Um, you know what my daughter said in the YouVersion Bible app? Are you in that, in the plan with the fasting plan? Neela says, I, th I think God wants me to be more grateful for food because I'm not snacking. And I'm getting more grateful for food. So I, th I thought that was pretty cute. Um, some of you are like, I'm fasting. I'm going to fast being, being nice to people. <laughs> if you're fasting that, you are probably doing that anyways. So um, fasting vegetables, not a fast. I tried that one. That didn't fly. Um, we are starting a men's group, actually. Um, so, um, so the QR code, uh, men, get in there. Women, get your men in there. This may be a, a surprise to you, but they need to be around the men of Venue Church. We're doing a breakfast on February the 4th, Saturday morning, right? Um, and so we're going to do a men's breakfast. Uh, we're going to get together maybe like once a month or something like that. So scan that QR code. Just join that group anyways, even if you can't make the 4th. Just join that group. And girls, make it easy for your men to connect with Venue Men. Because you've been trying to make him a better man, but the only thing that can make a better man is a better man. Unless you want us lecturing you about childbirth and stuff. Ooh, tension. Oh, you just wait. You just wait. Um, also, there's a women's group that's going to meet because we have questions coming up in small group about the topic of sex. Men, husbands, get your wives to that. Look after the kids. Do whatever you have to do. Don't be stupid. Um, Pastor Aaron is actually going to lead that uh, and with a panel of some of the venue women. So we will tackle these subjects. In fact, I'm preaching about sex next in February. So, um, yeah, if you're not checking your kids into venue kids, this service looks pretty good. But if you're not doing that, I would suggest doing that immediately for a number of different reasons, um, unless you enjoy really awkward conversations at home. Um, and this space, too, I should say this, this space is designed not to 
um, cause children under 12. This is 12 and up in here. It's not to cause children and you're like, my 12 year old can't hear this. I'm like, they've already heard it in school, by the way. So we might as well get God's counsel into them. Now that's up to you, if, if uh, of course. But here's what I would say. This, this space is not designed for children to grow spiritually. That space over there is designed for that. And you may not know this, but, but not that long ago, spiritual leaders and parents were right at the top of like who, who kids and teenagers go to, who they care about, like whose opinions matter to them the most. Now parents and spiritual leaders, we are down here. Guess who's up here? Friends. Friends. When they're 17, this is a shock to you, they're not gonna care what you think at all. In fact, they're gonna think they're smarter than you are, but they're not gonna think they're smarter than their youth leaders and their friends. And that's where we develop that. So um, I'll go at the second service a little more with that one. You guys uh, are doing a great job with that. So um, thanks, Sean. Um, we have over 80 people in Financial Freedom Group right now. I don't know if you, that's a small group. Um, and so, Arwen is looking through her financial freedom notes. Can I brag on one of my kids a little bit? Arwen is 20 right now. She bought a car for cash for $8,500. We have given her $0 of all of this, her mother and I. You're terrible parents. I, I don't think so, I think it's working. Um, she worked for it. By the time she was out of high school, she had this money saved. She bought a car for cash. I'm very, she had more money than I ever had in high school. Uh, I worked through high school too, but I spent it on stupid stuff. So. Um, but she was looking through her financial freedom notes. She has to this date saved $20,000. She's gonna squirm. I didn't tell her I was gonna do this because I'm dad and I can do whatever I want. She saved $20,000. She gave $3,000 to Hart for the house and $3,000 to Substance Church Hearts for the house. And she still has this $20,000, right? So you're like, what is she selling? I'm like, I don't know. She robs banks, she's gotta think. No, she just works hard and doesn't spend a lot of money on what we spend money on. And so she was going through her financial freedom notes and she said, I know you're all super jealous about that, but go to financial freedom. And it's not like God's just going to pick her and be like, bless her. Um, God will bless you too. So she decided that she needed to write a will because Dave Ramsey said so. If you're over 18, you need to write a will. Well, most of us don't have anything to give away, so it's not going to matter. But, um, but she says she wrote a will up and so she was with her sisters and I. And this is her will. I, Arwen Cope, hereby declare that all my possessions will go to Corey Cope in the event that he is dead. <laughs> my possessions shall go to Aaron Cope. These items include, but are not limited to, my vehicle, money and savings, laptop, and phone. I'm 100% sure that that's my phone, by the way. Um, so, thank you. Um, the exceptions to this are my books, which will go to Kathleen Cope, and my rubber duck paraphernalia, which will go to Ailish Cope. So then, then she takes this and we're laughing about this because this is just a Cope family. This is just what we do. Like, we don't think it's, it's not weird if you don't think that it is. And so we're talking about this. Like if I die and then she goes to Neela, I heard later, she goes, I'm sorry that you weren't in the will. And she goes, no, I am. And then we found the piece of paper on the table and Neela put a sticker over Corey Cope and put Neela in there. <laughs> She's like, no, I'm in there. So I thought that was funny. Um, Pastor Aaron reads this. She comes down and it's like, what's, what's everybody laughing about? She reads it and she's like, she goes, I'm being honest here. She goes, how come dad gets all the money and tries to hit her, misses, because maybe she knew that that wasn't great. And then like swung again and got her in the shoulder. And I'm like, I feel like you missed the whole, like I died. And so I just want, I just want her to add as a caveat in there that she, Pastor Aaron can be responsible for Arwen's resources if I die accidentally. <laughs> I just want that just to be so. Now listen, listen. Arwen can do whatever she wants to with the money that she has earned. Like that is hers. So whether she gives that to me or sisters or you or the church or which I'm going to talk to her about because I think that the church is a great work if you die. Like what else can you do that bears eternal? And so, but anyways, um, what I would say is, what I would say is she can give it to the neighborhood cat. It's hers to do with. Like that's not an unfair thing for me not to get that or have responsibility or do whatever. That's not unfair to me because that's just like, it doesn't belong to me. You can do whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like if my parents... When they go to heaven, whatever they want to do with that, it's not, I don't care. Like, do whatever you want to. Now, that's not unjust. Um, this sermon is called, Don't Treat Me Right. Oh, no, it's, 
It's so catchy. Don't treat me right, the test of injustice. So like, this is the idea behind the sermon. Has anybody watched John Wick? I haven't, but I've heard about it. I've heard a lot about it. Um, when they're like, John, they'll be expecting you when he's trying to go after, they'll be expecting you and he says, it won't matter. As in, treat me right, don't treat me right. It won't matter. I'm still going to do everything in this life that God wants me to do. You don't get to decide that for me. I'm deciding that I'm going to do everything that God is telling me to do. Treat me right, don't treat me right. By the time this sermon is over, you're going to understand that that can't stop you anymore. Now, how you respond in injustice will tell us how mature your faith is. I heard a, um, a world-class leader say one time, whenever I want to know how one of my staff is doing, like how their hearts are doing, he says, I'll just, I'll just test them a little. I'll just ask them to do something that they didn't want to do. And then I'll know. No, not a sin or anything. It's just like, hey, instead of doing it this way, can you just do it this way? And then I'll know how their heart is doing. Well, I thought, when God is testing you, like he probably did this week, and you definitely will by the time you get home today, about this test of injustice, when God is testing you, it's not like school where they're testing you because they don't really know where you're at. God, I know this is hard to imagine, already knows exactly where you're at. The test is actually, and maybe you failed this test this week, I can guarantee that most of us did, the test of injustice. Most of us failed the test of justice. Like when we have bad friends and it backfires on us. Most of us failed that test and we're upset at God. That's not like unfair, you know what I'm saying? You misspend your money, then you get angry at God because you misspent your money and you don't have it anymore. That's not a test, just a test of justice. You know, there's a scripture that says, but I'm going to just Corey phrase this for, just paraphrase this. Like if you're really stupid and get the consequence of that and bear it patiently, nobody cares. Like who's going to be like, great job. You really wrecked your life and you're taking it patiently. Like great job. There is however, the test of injustice. Now when God tests you, it's not so that he needs to know where you're at. It's because you don't know where you're at. It's hard to take a sermon and do it if you think I'm preaching to your wife. That's why I toss tension in early. Because you need to know something that upsets you. Okay, there's something in there that's not submitting yet to the will of God and the word of God. Good. Now we know it's for you. Now we know it's for me. Um, being corrected is not a horrible injustice, by the way. Oh my goodness, aren't you glad somebody has the guts to be like, dude, you gotta stop that. You gotta stop hanging out with that secretary. Come on, like, like you gotta stop. Like, you gotta stop thinking that way. You gotta stop watching that stuff. You just, the Bible says only fools hate correction. That is not injustice when somebody corrects you for something that you're doing wrong. That is a mercy and kindness. It just doesn't feel that way when it's happening sometimes because we're not as wise as we should be. Somebody being promoted at work because they're better than you are is not a horrible test of injustice. You know what equal opportunity doesn't mean equal opportunity anymore. You know what it means is like, well, I should be able to like show up whenever I want and get paid the same as that guy. Well, that guy got up at 4 a.m. to get there. Everybody getting paid the same is called communism. For doing like whatever. I'm like, sorry, if you enjoy Sadly, the more socialistic we get, I don't know. Okay, I'm not going to do that. You can't distract me. I really want to. What happened? I mean, what happened to the world? This is like evolution, survival of the fittest. Now it's like, hey, everybody, participation badges, everybody. It's the same as winning stuff. Okay. We're going to be talking about Joseph. Um, when I think of some of the nationalities represented here, and I don't know everybody's story, but I think the things that if you were born and bred in Canada or you're like, you know, I'm like a one, two, three, third generation Canadian, the things that upset me that I think are unjust or perceived injustice, like the Starbucks line being super long, <laughs> and them getting, you know, my name wrong on the cup, and I'm like, it's not Gord, it's Corey. It's not even the same word. 
you know, I think about like, I think about like our uh, Nigerians. We were talking to uh, Dr. Joseph and, and Lily and, you know, in Nigeria, when you get out of school, you got to go work on the other side of Nigeria for, I think it's, how long is it? One year? One year? One year? Thank you. One year for free and you get to feed yourself over there too. Well, try that in Canadian culture. And then, then you, know, you know, you talk to like Rwandans here. And I'm sitting in Starbucks line being like, this is the greatest injustice <laughs> in the history of mankind. What we consider injustice is just, it's not actually injustice, most of it. It's just that we're so soft and, and God wants to toughen us up. So, um, I could go through all that. I'm going to get into the other thing here. Um, Can I just explain this whole justice and justice? I just feel like I need to kind of circle back here. Now, the world is broken. So what is fair now in the world is sin and brokenness and death because sin always leads to separation and sin. The result of sin, the word of God says, the wages of sin is death. The death, the erosion of the planet and the world and its people. So that actually is justice because that is just the harvest of the seed sown by Adam and Eve. And if you don't think that that's fair that... You pay the price for somebody else. It's not fair, too, if you want to take drugs and birth a baby. Like, what does fair mean? You know what I'm saying? It's not good, but it's the way of the world. God gave, uh, created an Eden for us where he came and walked with us every evening, Adam and Eve. And they're like, thank you. We want a different dad who's this ugly devil over here. Like, so we, and, and then you know that even after you were born into that, you and I have committed that same crime against heaven, right? So, so justice now is a little bit now, if you want to create salvation, let me go at it this way. Let me go at it this way. When a soldier goes off to war to fight, I was watching that uh, Churchill, that is an incredible movie that you should watch when Hitler's coming marching across Europe and when soldiers go to war, they're fighting for your freedom. But what does it cost them personally? Freedom. The cost of your freedom and salvation is somebody has to pay a price to pay for it. So they get on ships and boats and march and die. They are giving up their freedom so that you can gain freedom and the salvation of that oppressor, right? That is how it is with Christ. Somebody has to, here's, here's two words I want you to remember, eat injustice. Because they didn't deserve that war. Somebody has to eat injustice to bring salvation. Now, if your neighborhood is going to come into Christ, somebody in that block has got to be able to eat injustice to bring salvation. Which means you've got to be willing to be hated a little to be mistreated a little if you want to bring salvation. St weak people don't eat injustice. Now, I don't mean you hang out with people that hurt you and abuse you and they're your friends. That's just bad decision making. I am talking about God will ask you to bear a cross at some point, but you need strength to bear a cross. But the cross is not necessarily fair to you, right? As far as we're thinking of, of, of fairness. Now, if God can't find injustice eaters, the world is lost. Your theology uh, might not agree with, with what I'm going to share. Your th uh, theology, if you're new to church, is just what we believe about God. Now, I think that we care about our theology a lot more than God cares about it. Sometimes I hear people like, well, that doesn't agree with my theology. I'm like, I would care more about that if you were God. I love you. That's why I hurt you. Um, your theology, if it's weak, may not agree with this, but when my parents, um, new house, new car, new everything, great jobs, they had everything that you want, everything that everybody in your block is trying to get. They had it all. And they're like, ah, God called them to move to Los Angeles in the eighties before internet, before Google maps. So they left all of this stuff that, that God had provided for them. They left it all because their lives didn't have the purpose that God wanted for them. 
You can have everything and have no purpose and it won't matter. So they left and they went to Los Angeles to work for a missions organization for free on their own savings, right? A year into staying there, um, the, the, one of the directors of the mission board or whatever, he came and said, hey, we didn't charge you rent for this year. And my dad's like, well, that was the agreement because you had this property. We're here working for free. The agreement was that you were supposed to. And he basically lied and said, no, you're actually supposed to back pay that. So he's basically trying to steal from a family who's paid all this cost to live there and work for them for nothing, right? So, so, so I know what you and I would do. I'd be like, I'm gonna burn this whole place to the ground. <laughs> no, like I'd just nod and smile and be like, okay, if that's what you wanna do. Irish. I'm just like, yeah, no, that's fine. That's your decision. No, but you know what God told him to do? And this is why I wanna agree with your theology. God said, pay them what they claim you stole. Okay, now it's not even about the money. Now I'm gonna look guilty when I'm not guilty. And my dad did, because that's what God told him to do. He ate the injustice. It's okay. God got back double to my parents every month, double. I could tell you the story, but it doesn't matter. God, God sorted it out. Could you do something like that? I mean, based on your last week and what we got upset about, I don't know. One time, I must have had a good day. <laughs> One time, God told me to call somebody up who had uh, wronged me. And looking back now, my opinion about that hasn't changed at all. Like, I was not in the wrong morally or anything about this thing. In fact, the other person was. God told me to call this person up and apologize and mean it. Now, some of y'all can't apologize when you screwed something up and you know that you screwed something up and you can't apologize and make yourself mean it. Well, my brain does not work like that, everybody. My brain is like, I cannot watch movies about genocides. I'm like, I'm on a, a boat to, Aaron, I'm getting on an airplane and you may not see me again, but I'm gonna destroy some people. I, I can't, my soul can't handle it. I get so angry. And this is now feeling like an injustice to myself. And, it, and, it, and so this is a conversation I had with God. This is a conver you ever have those conversations with God? And I'm like, God, you know that I didn't do anything wrong in this. And this is what God said to me. Okay. <laughs> like, well, maybe he wasn't listening. God, <laughs> but you know that they should be apologizing. And he's like, okay. So I did the hard thing and I made a phone call. I cried on the phone. I had to work my soul up to mean it and I had to own it and I did. Looking back now, that was just the grace of God because even now I look back and I'm like, that wasn't my problem. I cried on the phone, everybody. I don't cry on the phone. Why would you cry on the telephone? Nobody can even see that you're worked up. <laughs> Does that mean it make any sense? And I don't like crying. I think it was that night or the next day I talked to my parents before we moved here and because uh, I took dad's church over in the little community north of, of here where we were and 30 years of their lives I asked if they would be willing to because I said God has told us to move and close this down 30 years of their lives in a 15 minute conversation because I ate injustice and, and because my parents are great people in a 15 minute conversation they said to me well, if that's what God is telling you to do, then that's what you'd better do and we'll help you. 30 years of their lives. I learned it from somewhere. You try that. Try it sometime. Give every cent that you have to the ministry. To give, pour out your lives and be betrayed and give that away and then watch your arrogant son. Why? Because I ate a bit of injustice because I got tackled so that my team could score a touchdown. And what God is doing here now exists because of that conversation, because I ate a little injustice, because before that they ate a little injustice. All the souls we have baptized because somebody was willing to eat a little bit of injustice, look like an idiot so that the name of God could be honored, maybe. Um, I'm curious what injustice you refuse to eat. 
Like, why can't you lose an argument? Why do you care? Do you know what your marriage would look like if you just let yourself get tackled every now and again so that the team could score a football? Uh, a football? Score a football. <laughs> Say amen, Ben Church. Back me up here. Amen, Ben, score a football. I know what football is. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's exhausting to be your own defense lawyer. Jesus wasn't his own defense lawyer, and he had a pretty good brain. If the enemy can get you worked up, he can get you off mission. Always like trying to get everybody to treat you a certain way. That's what the message is in the world, by the way. You got to be treated a certain way. You got to be treated a certain way. You got to be treated a certain way. Look, I'm not saying put up with a lot of crap, and if there's something going on in your life that's like that, you need to get some help from your small group leader. Because some of that is just you're enabling bad behavior by people. You don't need to be with crazy people. But there's another side of this too that sometimes God is like, what would you eat so that I could save that person or get into that family? What would you do? Um, the devil loves it when you're your own defense lawyer. He loves it because he doesn't have to go to work that day. He gets to sleep in because you're going to do it to yourself. Just you. And that's what really hurts. You so do it to yourself. You do. You and no one else. You do it to. Somebody needs to start listening to real music radio head fans. Come on. <laughs> Embarrassing. Embarrassing. You ready? Joseph, somewhere along the way, stopped thinking he needed to be treated well to fully function. That's it. Somewhere along the way of his horrible path of injustice, he stopped thinking he needed to be treated a certain way that it was conditional on somebody else's decision to fully function. Well, I can't, you don't understand, Pastor. No, no, read his story. And if your story is worse than his story, then come talk to me. But it's probably not. Here's, here's his, listen. If you have to be treated a certain way, listen, do you suppose the devil has a shortage of idiots at his disposal to send to you? Do you think he's like, I need an idiot. I just can't find any. Because if I send him to you, like you're going to get off track and you're going to get upset with a little bit of drama and somebody's going to hurt you and somebody's going to, they will be lined up around the block if that's your price tag. The way God allowed the world to resist Jesus made him strong enough to carry a cross and be hung on it. Because weak people don't hang on crosses. And what we want in Jesus now is this like nice and flowery, tender. I don't know how tender Jesus was. I think he was kind, but I think he was pretty tough. Carried his cross till his body gave out. You don't get that with like a... Like I don't appreciate the way... Oh my goodness, if I hear that phrase one more time. I just don't appreciate the way that she looked at me. I just don't appreciate it. So God is trying to save people's lives and we're trying to save our own feelings. When your neighbor gets to heaven because you ate injustice, you'll see it then. Who's got a little faith to try to get there first though? Who's got a little faith to be like, Okay, I know what's going on right now in my family. I know, I know that there's injustice coming my way so that somebody's soul, so I can forgive and somebody's soul can be released. I, know, I get it now. I get it now. After Joseph had been taken to Egypt, Potiphar, an Egyptian, one of Pharaoh's officials and the manager of his household, or uh, this could more likely be translated captain of his guard, or this, this word, executioner. So if, it's, if I'm Joseph and I got to get sold into slavery, I'm going to be like, can you, I'd like to get sold to like the cupcake maker. You know, is that, is that a thing? I'll get up early. As long as I get those cupcakes. Now listen. Uh, the chief executioner. This guy was not emotionally dialed into anything. He was like, Joseph, we need to help you find yourself. Let's help you find you, Joseph. What is it that you like to do? There's a church plant uh, young pastor that I'm helping. That's a great guy. 
And he's like, you know, I'm just trying to help people find their passions. And I'm like, you know what? I'm at this place in church planting where it's not a plant anymore, and I don't care about people's passions anymore. What I care about is Jesus' passions. It's like, I just really want to, like, paint flowers for Jesus. And I'm like, that's great. But if you don't work it into, like, an actual life mission that matters, what if your real calling hasn't even been discovered yet because you haven't joined the dream team and served? Because that's where it comes out. I'm like, that's great. But, like, a real passion has nothing to do with you and has to do with the... Anyway. I'm like, yeah, we don't talk like that anymore. We're a little tougher than... As it turns out, God was with Joseph and things went very well with him. He ended up living in the home of his Egyptian master. Okay, okay, things are looking up. His master recognized God was with him, saw that God was working for good in everything he did. He became very fond of Joseph and made him his personal aid. Now, I'm going to talk maybe next week about how if you can't serve somebody else's vision, stop asking for your own. He put him in charge of his personal affairs, turning everything over to him. Just imagine this, like this young Hebrew boy. From that moment on, God blessed the home of the Egyptian. I pray this over you too. If you're a godly person, I pray that, that the masters, that the employers would see that, hey, you're blessed with everything you do. We got to get that blessing on everything. Be promotable. Stop seeking promotion. Be promotable. Do everything you do well. Um, the blessing spread over everything he owned. Uh, and all Potiphar had to do, uh, concern himself with was eating three meals a day. Now, I know that that's what you want to do. But that's not what God wants you to do. Um, Joseph was a strikingly handsome man. Who does that remind us of? <laughs> I'm just kidding. My mom, my mom said when I was little that I had a, a face for radio. Now, as time went on, his master's wife became infatuated with Joseph and one day said, sleep with me. Man, this gal is trashy. It's like housewives of Egypt here. And like, he wouldn't do it though. He said to his master's wife, look with me here. My master doesn't give a second thought to anything that goes on here. He's put me in charge of everything. He treats me as an equal. The only thing he hasn't turned over to me is you. You're his wife after all. How could I violate his trust and sin against God? She pestered him day after day after day. Now listen, if you have a slavery mindset, you'll sleep with that. Because you're like, well, I'm here and none of this is fair and I might as well. Because God doesn't love me and it doesn't matter. And there is something else in him. He's like, that, no. There's just a, I am working too hard and investing too much here to throw it all away. When she realized, uh, uh, one, he caught, she caught, he came into the house to do his work. She grabbed him by his cloak, saying, sleep with me. He left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she realized um, he'd run outside, she said to her servants, look, this Hebrew shows up here. And before you know it, he's trying to seduce us. He tried to make love to me. Get your kids checked in. But I yelled as loud as I could. I definitely did. And everybody heard me, right? With all my yelling and screaming, so much of it. He left his coat and ran outside. If I'm the stable boy, and, and she just like, hey, this guy comes into the house, and then he tries to seduce us. And if I'm the stable boy, I'm looking at the dishwasher, and I'm like, us? Like, he mostly just yells at us. Like, hey, man, nobody's going to clean those dishes. Like, has he tried to, like... You got to read the Bible like you didn't grow up in church, y'all. An unchurched person is reading this and they're like, this is crazy. Like, that's literally what she's saying. Like, he's trying to seduce us all. Yeah, you too? And they're like, no. What? No, gross. <laughs> hey, shovel that stable. Stop trying to seduce me. It's crazy. I mean, the Bible's just recording things that actually happened. She kept the coat there, the Hebrew slave. She says to her husband, the one you, you brought to us, you bad husband. This is all about you. This is just what liars do. They just blame everybody else for, for their issues. The words that they use are words that are their problems, not your problems. Just saving you a little bit of trouble there. He came after me and tried to use me for his plaything. 
Well, that's what she kind of wanted. When I yelled and screamed, which I definitely did, he ran outside. When his master heard his wife's story, he was furious. Now, if you're married to a floozy, you might know that you're married to a floozy. So I think he was furious, but it says that he threw him in the king's jail. So um, right there, like, life is cheap in Egypt. So I think if he really believed his wife, he'd have just killed him. Like, he was the executioner. He says, like, what to do with you? What to do with you? But he's probably furious. He's in a bad spot. His wife is not a great lady. Um, but it says, but they're in jail. Now let this sink into you. God was still with Joseph. God's training wasn't done yet because the end wasn't Potiphar's house. The end is not where you are. Even if you have success, that's not the end. He has more influence than he has planned for you, but he's got to take you down because you still think the influence is about you. He's not done training you yet. He's, he needs to train you with more injustice over a period of time. We overestimate what we could do in the short term and underestimate what God could do in the long term. It's not a sprint. He reached out in kindness to Joseph. He put him on good terms with the head jailer. The head jailer put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners. He ended up managing the whole operation. The head jailer gave Joseph free reign, never even checked in on him. See, you and I want that, but we don't want to do all the work. Right? The reason he didn't need to check in on him because he never needed to because he never dropped a detail. Whatever he did, God made sure it worked out for the best. Don't miss that sentence. Whatever Joseph did, God made sure it worked out for the best. You're so busy trying to plan your life. That's not important. If you're under authority and in the anointing, God can even take a bad plan and pour his power upon it and make it work. You're trying to figure out your teenager's heart and come up with a plan and God's like actually if you would just go and serve and eat a little injustice and go and forgive your neighbor I could work on their heart and you're like that doesn't make sense and God is like not to you but it still works I think I think you have to self talk your way out of slavery during this fast you have to start talking to yourself not like you're a slave I can't do this because they Stop it. Stop saying it. I can't do it because they, because he, because she, because I can't, because somebody else outside of myself. If God is your God, then God is your God and you don't need anybody to tell you that you can do something or can't do something. And maybe God has you in prison right now so that you eat a little injustice so you understand the way of the cross. Because if there's no cross, there's no resurrection. And sometimes we want our marriages to be resurrected, but we won't die to self. We want our finances to be resurrected, but we won't die to what we want. Self-talk. There was a time in my life I was under so much pressure. I would have to wake up in the morning and the first things I'd have to be like, get up. You're a son of God, get up. You're not going to die today, get up. No matter what happens today, you're strong. You're going to do it. The devil can't kill you. You're not going to quit. You're the son of the living God. You can do everything that he wants you to do. You're a soldier. Get up. Somebody needs to learn to self-talk their way out of their defeatism and their slavery mentality. And I started to look a little more like Jesus when I ate a little more injustice and life started getting saved. And then this is where you need to get to. You're asking for justice from humans hurting you. And we're about this far apart from each other. You might be better than they are, but that's about the distance. But then we start, we got to get in our hearts to this place where we realize my sin and crime against heaven, this is where God is. Ooh, and the, the gap that needs to be bridged. Who cares what I eat down here? If he'll save me from my crime against him because my sin put Jesus on a cross that he didn't deserve. Surely I can eat a little injustice today by the power of the living God. Surely I can forgive. Surely I can let it go. Surely I can talk my way into it because look at what I've been forgiven. <laughs>